Ng, International Vice President of Lambda Alpha International. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first in a three-part series of webinars, reflecting on and exploring the history of LAI as we celebrate the organization's 90th anniversary. I've been reading the, the book, The Color of Law. It's the inspiration for today's talk. And I've really appreciated this opportunity to get a deeper understanding of my own profession as an urban planner. The response to today's program has been great, and we have about 175 people registered to attend. Although members in our 29 chapters um, haven't been able to gather together to attend presentations like this in person this last year, LAI as a whole has benefited from the opportunity to provide programming virtually. Bringing members together like this globally has made our mission a reality. More than ever, we feel this is an important way to be together safely and a reminder that we're all in this together. So with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Christine Williams, who is LAI's historian and a member of the Chicago Ely chapter. Um, we are going to be holding questions during the program today until the end. Um, I will be um, you know, uh, announcing the questions when the program ends and we can get into our Q&A. And I'm also really thrilled, I just heard we're able to uh, premiere our 90th anniversary logo video. So Sheila Hamilton, our executive director is going to uh, show everyone that right now. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila, and, and thank you to everyone who answered our call to send us a, a selfie. I've watched that, that about 100 times now, and I enjoy it every time. Um, so I'm Christine Williams, and as the historian, and as we celebrate LAI's 90th anniversary, we are reflecting on the intersection of land economics and equal justice. Two men in LAI's early history are well-recognized land economists. LAI was founded in 1930 at Northwestern University by a group of young men who had studied under Professor Richard T. Ely. The second prominent economist associated with LAI is Homer Hoyt, whose PhD thesis from the University of Chicago in 1934 established precedents for valuation and land analysis. His influence on risk assessment while at the FHA and his famous sector theory have led to his association with the origins of redlining. Homer Hoyt founded the first LAI chapter outside of Chicago in 1949 when he moved to New York City. He then served uh, two terms as international president of LAI. So our speakers today are Ladeo Winling, an associate professor in the Virginia Tech Department of History. Dr. Winling's studies in architecture, urban planning, and history include advanced degrees from the University of Michigan as you might guess from the pendant behind him. Dr. Winling's newest book will explore the careers of two economists, Richard T. Ely and Robert C. Weaver. And if I can make a historian's note to um, Ledeo, um, um, Robert Weaver spoke to LAI in 1972 at its biannual Congress in, that was held in Toronto. Um, 
uh, this our um, Peter Hen Hendy Brown is a planner, architect, and development consultant in Minneapolis. He also teaches at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Dr. Brown earned degrees from Cornell and the University of Pennsylvania. As president of our Minnesota chapter, he led a compelling discussion of Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law, A Forgotten History, of uh, how our government segregated America, which was the inspiration of for this series. So, Peter, thank you. Thank you, Liddell. Thanks, Christine. Thank you, Kathy. Nice to see you, Liddell. Uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, we're really glad to have you here today, and um, we're here today uh, to talk about, you know, Christine, I think did a really great job of summing that up. We're here to talk about two uh, figures who are really important to the founding and growth of our organization, Lambda Alpha International, uh, Richard T. Ely and Homer Hoyt, but they're also people who played important roles in creating the policies and frameworks that have led to segregation and racial discrimination in housing and in our cities and communities in America. Um, and so the reason we've asked Liddell to come, thank you, Liddell, for joining us, is that he is in the midst of a really, really interesting research and writing project uh, where these ideas and these policies and these people are kind of the heart of the, of the, of the, of the project. And I want to talk more about the, the idea behind that in your thesis. But before we go further, Liddell, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself, just kind of your background, how you got to where you are, what you study, what's your niche, what's your special perspective on this subject? Sure, thank you. Um, so I am trained in part as a historian. I think of myself as a historian. I um, went to, uh, did a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in history at Western Michigan University. And then I went on to the University of Michigan and earned a master's of urban planning degree and a PhD in architectural history in the College of Architecture and Urban Planning at Michigan. Um, but I have, um, taught in um, history departments. And so um, what I hope is that I kind of bring to bear um, the kind of professional and civic engagement of urban, urban planning to kind of the historical topics that I deal with, um, as well as the kind of um, rigor and doggedness uh, with detective work that uh, historians bring to, bring to their research. And, um, you know, so, if you do a PhD, as you know, right, you got to do a dissertation. So I wrote a dissertation on kind of the history of um, university development and urban politics um, that became a book. And now I'm working on a book on um, the kind of prelude and the challenges to redlining in the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s, which is a topic that I kind of really first encountered in graduate school. And, you know, over the course of my um, career thus far, have been able to spend some more time kind of researching it and helping kind of excavate the um, the, the, the materials for the public and like uh, providing resources for communities to kind of study redlining, racial segregation, um, and racial inequality in their own communities. Great, thanks. Um, now I want to talk a little bit more about the project, your book, uh, which is provisionally titled The Road to Redlining. Um, even in academic writing and history, history and nonfiction, you kind of have to have a story, a through line, or a plot of some kind. Can you talk a little bit more about what your the structure of it is? Because I think it's really interesting. Thank you. Um, the the you know um, I would say the last several years, certainly very intensely in the last year, uh, I think. Um, American communities have dealt with this kind of um, legacy and the implications and have wanted to learn more about racial inequality and especially um, like kind of spatial inequality and racial segregation in housing and in kind of like the geographies of their communities. And, um, you know, that was, I went through the same process, like I said, in kind of graduate school. And, you know, we have had several, you know, kind of um, stories or investigations um, about the history of redlining, which 
illustrate the kind of role of the federal government, the Homeowners Loan Corporation and the Federal Housing Administration, in particular, in kind of creating these programs and in creating these um, structures that shaped American communities over the last 80 to 100 years. But um, as I kind of researched in the archives, I came to realize that this was not only a kind of problem or um, is not only attributable to the federal government, that you know, the federal government, that Hulk and FHA um, were kind of federal responses to the crisis of the Great Depression. And when there was the collapse of the housing and real estate markets, as well as the financial markets in the Great Depression, first the Hoover administration and the Roosevelt administration um, were grasping for ideas. They're like, who knows anything? Who can tell us what to do about resuscitating the, um, the real estate economy and the financial sector? And it turned out that there had been um, a group of economists in the 1920s who partnered with real estate leaders um, to develop a whole set of ideas and a whole set of policy proposals that then the um, federal government kind of drew upon. They're like, yes, great, we need these ideas, let's, let's turn them into programs. So with that idea that there was kind of a process of making the, the of creating redlining, of, of, of changing these structures and informing the federal government, um, I kind of uh, was interested in investigating the making and like the unmaking or the challenges to redlining and racial segregation. And so um, I decided to kind of focus on two particular figures, um, Richard Ely, who is the head, kind of the leading economist, the leading academic, created this subfield of um, real estate economics in the 1920s. Um, and his work kind of laid the groundwork, laid the foundations for what would become redlining, as well as just the normal operation of kind of um, real estate markets and finance. And then also um, I came across the work of and learned more about the work of Robert Weaver, who um, was a, an economist, um, earned his degree from Harvard in the 1930s and became for you know about 30 years, the leading kind of African-American policy expert and policy maker who had devoted himself to fighting redlining, racial segregation, and all of these state sanctioned forms of racial inequality that had been kind of institutionalized over um, the kind of preceding decades. So essentially by looking at these two economists um, illustrating kind of the coalitions and the processes that went into creating redlining and it's kind of associated processes and effects and then the kind of battle to unmake redlining and to dismantle racial segregation viewed through the kind of lens of Robert Weaver's career and the kind of coalition um, within the NAACP and other organizations that kind of um, went into the battle against redlining. So it's kind of a, a story that starts in the 20s, and Ely is kind of an early figure who is a who helps create a lot of these things, and then Weaver is, uh, is you know 30 or 40 years later is the first HUD secretary who's trying to unravel and unmake some of these things, right? So yeah. let's talk about both of them. Thank you, and um, let's start with Ely. Uh, can you uh, you know we could he's a giant, and we could spend uh, another hour or two just talking about him, but if you could. Uh, could Give us kind of a quick character sketch, kind of a biography of his life and the high points of his career, where he came from, how he got to where he was and all that. He, absolutely. I and mean, Richard Ely was probably the most prominent economist for a half a century in the United States. He was one of the founders of the American Economics Association. Um, he was from um, Western New York, Chautauqua, New York. Um, had studied um, economics in Germany, um, University of Heidelberg, and then took a position at Johns Hopkins University. And that's where he helped um, create 
um, the AEA, American Econom Economics Association, which, you know, now it's like, that's, that's the major professional organization for economics, but it was kind of an upstart organization then. Um, and after uh, teaching at Hopkins for maybe eight, uh, almost a decade, um, he took a position at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and in each of those places, um, he was part of a, um, basically like a school of social sciences, the disciplines of history and economics and political science were not quite as disparate and distinct as they are now. So I'll say that um, when he was at Johns Hopkins, um, Ely was one of the graduate advisors of Woodrow Wilson when, you know, like far long before his political career started. And they actually um, were collaborating on a book that was never published, but they had kind of like an enduring relationship. And um, Richard Ely was a like key progressive figure. Um, you know, he advised presidents, not only Wilson, but also um, Teddy Roosevelt, um, and was, you know, not just a prominent economist, but was like uh, um, among the top figures in intellectual life in the United States during the progressive era in the 1890s, in the 19 knots, in the 19 teens. So prominent, in fact, that when um, a, a group of um, kind of progressive era reformers um, were horrified by the race riot in Springfield in 1908 and called a conference of some of the leading progressive figures in the country in 1909, they invited him to participate. So it was like, if you want Jane Addams and this type of um, reformer, you also want Richard Ely. And this organization, I mean, like this conference went on to um, be the founding of the NAACP. And Richard Ely actually said, you know, I've never concerned myself with what he called the Negro question. Um, and I thought I could always um, make greater uh, reforms and have greater social impact in other, in other areas. So he declined to participate, um, which is kind of illustrative of the kind of tense relationship or the tensions um, represented in his career between real estate and segregation, racial inequality, and, um, and, and kind of his, his reform impetus. Um, so he worked at University of Wisconsin for, um, let's see, about 30 years and got interested in real estate economics, created that subfield basically himself. And um, in the mid 1920s, wanted to move on to a larger city, wanted to partner with um, major real estate developers and professional organizations, as well as people in public utilities and um, moved, he founded a research institute and then moved it to um, Northwestern University in 1925, where he assembled a staff of researchers PhD students um, who of, of about 35 or 40 that kind of enacted this plan for changing the way, like basically turning real estate from um, a kind of practical profession into an academic science in service of that profession. Um, he then went on uh, can, can you talk a bit more, Liddell, about what he, when he, how he got into the uh, the Roosevelt administration? He, you know, he creates this. Uh, the, he starts finding this new economic science in Chicago, and I wanted to talk about that more in a little while. But then, he's kind of the right man at the right time, right? I was, uh, you know, he's got the right ideas. That uh, the, the depression happens, and all of a sudden, he's very influential. Can you talk more about how that kind of came about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would say, you know, um, first over the course of the 1920s, the, the guy was a, he had spent his whole career in like public outreach and in forming organizations that um, worked together with policymakers. And so he was like, mm, I know how to do this. I'm going to do this again. That's what kind of his key idea of um, land economics was and real estate economics. Um, so he spent the 1920s raising funds and kind of building a coalition and a set of alliances with other academics, with um, uh, trade industry organizations, um, and with like training um, 
graduate students and other faculty to kind of think about the kind of ideas that he was interested in. And so he had a pretty, uh, like a, a great network, uh, you know, in colloquial terms, um, Ely had like a great Rolodex, or I guess I've dated myself, like a great contacts list on his, on his phone, right? He could you know everybody and send letters to anybody in the country and get a response. And so, you know, for, for the better part of a decade, he was um, promoting these ideas. And, um, you know, he also believed in the fundamental value of like publication, not just publishing academic articles, but publishing these practical guides, textbooks. And he thought, mm, you know what, um, real estate can be a, like a, like a profession, a, a university trained profession, not something that you just pick up on the job, but something that you can actually study in academic terms over the course of four years. He helped create with the real estate, um, the National Association of Real Estate Boards, which is now NAR, um, both a non-college like kind of curriculum that you could take in night classes to teach people how to do um, real estate using their ideas, um, as well as college textbooks, how to integrate law, um, and especially how to um, conduct real estate appraisals to assess value and risk. Um, if someone invests in real estate property, like how do they even know how much it's worth? And what, are the, what are the basis for that? How do we calculate it? So um, he had trained, you know, some of the most prominent um, kind of e economists and were connected to some of the most prominent economists uh, across the country. Um, he was pretty well connected with Herbert Hoover. And in the early days of the Great Depression, Hoover uh, called the um, White House Conference on um, Home Ownership and Home Building with architects, with planners, with financial leaders, um, with people who were interested in taxation, um, as well as economists. And Ely was, you know, very prominent, very effective in this, as well as some of his kind of colleagues. And so um, Hoover, who had long had an interest in real estate, spent his um, time in the 1920s as Secretary of Commerce, promoting the use of zoning. Right? We think of zoning as like a local phenomenon, but Hoover at the, at the federal level, at the national level, is really the one who um, promoted it spread community after community, state by state. So Hoover um, turned some of the reports and some of the outcomes and discussions from this national conference into legislation, which created the Federal Home Loan Bank Board and um, brought aboard some of um, Ely's colleagues and collaborators to run this. Um, and then shortly thereafter, you know, he's tossed out of office and um, Roosevelt comes, comes aboard as, and kind of sweeps in the New Deal. Now we often think of, you know, like Roosevelt New Deal time type democratic politics as being diametrically opposed to Hoover type laissez-faire um, policy making, but in regards to home building, community building, it's, it's not true. Roosevelt and Hoover are basically like hand in glove. There's very, very little difference in um, Roosevelt officials, Roosevelt administration officials have said, we basically just continued what Hoover was doing. So they created the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which was under the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, um, and then began to populate that with people who had, um, been affiliated, been part of this um, institute at Northwestern University, um, including some people whose names you might know, Fred Frederick Babcock, pardon me, Frederick Babcock, who had been a real estate appraiser and then became the head of underwriting for the Federal, um, Federal Housing Administration. Um, as well as um, Homer Hoyt, who had gotten his PhD at the University of Chicago, but um, had attended seminars and um, had been advised in part by some of the colleagues um, at, in economics at Northwestern, um, Herbert Dorau and um, Herbert Simpson um, among them. And so these kind of like Chicago figures um, had prominent roles as well as operational roles within the within Holt and within FHA, which 
by the mid 1930s was the only game in town. They were the only people doing any lending. And so they basically got to set the rules of the game. Um, Hulk and FHA established the, this um, 15 year mortgage, which made things um, a lot more predictable. Um, the typical mortgage had been like a three, five or seven year with balloon, mm -hmm. balloon payments. And so 15 years is very predictable. So basically made home ownership, home borrowing, um, much more attractive, much more affordable, much more accessible. And it proved so popular that essentially Hulk and FHA got to rewrite the rules of the housing and finance sector and then train all the people who then went back into private practice, especially with um, home appraisals, like what goes into evaluating and how in underwriting do you evaluate a loan or loan prospects. Um, so Ely himself um, never served in the Roosevelt administration. Um, in fact, like all of the fundraising that he had successfully done in the 1920s, a lot of that evaporated with the stock market crash and with the financial crisis. Um, and so he had to really scale back his operations. He was getting like quite old at the time. He was in his early 70s. And so he kind of semi-retired and moved to New York, remained influential, especially through um, the people that he had trained and kind of um, oriented towards the um, towards land economics and how you think of real estate as an economic science. Um, and that was really kind of, kind of how his influence was felt, even though he himself kind of like lost his grip on the levers of power. So in a way he and, and the folks that he worked with and trained uh, were sort of the right people at the right time in the right place with the right ideas, with the resources in the thirties to re to build a whole new kind of economic you know, set of framework, uh, housing economic frameworks for our country that we've now are now in place for basically 20, almost a hundred years. Let's flip the telescope around. Tell us a little bit more about Weaver and look back the other way. And what is he, you know, what is his role in all of this? Yeah. Sir, um, Weaver had come from, um, you know, was a fairly successful middle-class African-American family in Washington, D.C. His father had been, a de uh, pardon me, his grandfather had been a dentist trained at Harvard University in the 19th century. His father had been a um, postal, postal worker, which is a kind of solid middle-class profession in the 19 knots, 19 teens. Um, but, you know, Weaver was, um, you know, like quite clever and where he really went from um, kind of uh, 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 took his position on the national stage was when the Roosevelt administration Congress was um, passing and debating um, the National Industrial Recovery Act. This is a 1935 piece of legislation that had um, that reestablished or asked industries, um, industry leaders in sectors around the economy to kind of establish new work codes, new labor codes and so forth. And so um, there was a hearing coming up and Weaver and um, one of his colleagues from Harvard, um, a law student realized that there really had been no provisions for African-Americans in these industry codes. And they're like, this, this doesn't make sense. Who's protesting this? You know, the NAACP had not been kind of clued into this, was not, you know, as robust an organization as it was later. And they said like, hmm, how about we call ourselves like um, uh, a kind of uh, um, an organization and um, say that we'll, f we'll testify for you know, the hearings. And so made a, made a great splash in front of Congress and with um, the Roosevelt administration and then got a job was like basically the highest ranking African-American in um, the Roosevelt administration was a um, assistant to um, Harold Ickes and a member of this informal black cabinet that would inform or advise um, the Roosevelt's on African-American issues and the effects of legislation and so forth. Um, from that point, he kind of bounced around, um, you know, in a wide array of efforts between um, the policy world and um, the academic world, um, studying as well as working to kind of battle against racial inequalities and racial segregation. Um, so he was, because he was a member of the Black Cabinet, um, he got a call from FHA office um, staff member 
in Brooklyn um, in the late 30s saying, I got to tell you, we're not making loans or guaranteeing loans to African Americans um, or for anybody on a house who does not have a restrictive covenant. Like that's our key disqualifier. You got to have a restrictive covenant, which you know inherently uh, basically excludes African Americans, and it also makes sure that um, the communities where even loans, mortgages were made and guaranteed for white folks would exclude African Americans. And so um, Weaver took that to um, leaders at the NAACP who confronted Roosevelt about it, um, who kind of poo-pooed it and said, we're following the market. But then, you know, there was a little bit of kind of reform response. Um, Weaver, um, in the mid 1940s worked with Thurgood Marshall to develop a strategy for attacking um, racially restrictive covenants, which had become like hand in glove. Like basically these two things worked together um, with uh, redlining. Basically a, a neighborhood would not be considered a, a green or a neighborhood or a blue or B neighborhood best or still desirable without like heavy, heavy coverage of restrictive covenants. And we know in the 1930s that um, the use of these really blew up in cities across the country in part because of the federal backing. So developed a Weaver and Marshall developed a kind of both academic and legal strategy for battling restrictive covenants that eventually paid off in the challenge um, in the Supreme Court case, Shelley versus Kramer, uh, which was a couple of challenges to restrictive covenants um, that came together in Washington in a 1948 decision that said, ended up saying that they were unenforceable and kind of um, dramatically diminished the use of restrictive covenants and then undercut a key leg of redlining. Well, thanks. Um... I got three. I have three more questions I want to go through with you in, in about the next ten or twelve minutes. So first, I want to ask uh, now. Take a little bit. Take a little bit of time. To, uh, take a couple of minutes. Tell us a bit more about Homer Hoyt. Why was he important, and what did he contribute to? Uh, what was his role in, in uh, redlining and in and and in just the real estate uh, economics, uh, uh, academia, and in uh, the Hoyt Institute and his professional world in life. <clears throat> Yeah, and I want to say about um, both Ely and Hoyt, you know, these were two um, men, academic figures who were kind of at the, at the, at the top of, you know, the industry at the top of the kind of real estate sector, both academically in terms of their policy influence, and in terms of their kind of like um, influence on practical real estate development. And I would say like, not only were they, did they, they were, they were right in the middle of, you know, like mainstream best practices. Um, and, you know, we'll say like times have dramatically changed. And so now we would think of both Ely and of Homer Hoyt and their work in this era in the 1930s, 1940s and say like, this is, this is abhorrent. Um, it, but like I said, not only were they right kind of in the middle of the mainstream, they were in positions where they actually, in some ways, they established what mainstream real estate practice, mainstream um, economic valuation practice and theories were. Um, Homer Hoyt was kind of a prodigy, grew up in um, just outside um, Kansas City, Missouri, and he went to the University of Kansas. He graduated Phi Beta Kappa at age 17. Um, he went on to get a law degree from the University of Chicago in 1923 and then um, worked, he kind of bounced around academia. He was a professor without a PhD, with just with, with a law degree, um, even before he finished his law degree at a number of universities, it's like the University of Delaware, for example, University of North Carolina. He had kind of like these two-year visiting positions where he would lecture, give lectures about law, real estate, and so forth. Um, and then he also worked in kind of um, real estate consulting. And it landed in Chicago in the 1920s, came back to Chicago, and then got his PhD from in, in economics from the University of Chicago. Um, and he did an incredible, incredible 
um, uh, um, kind of mode or, or process of data collection, analog data collection that went into his dissertation that was published as a book called 100 Years of Land Values. And, um, you know, basically the time that he spent at like the Cook County um, Assessor's Office looking at tax records and valuation records was absolutely un unprecedented, like Herculean. And I'd say actually only now with the digitization of, you know, like decades of records, can, can we kind of like equal that. But he came from like one of the most prominent graduate schools in the country. Um, he was affiliated with like the, the most prominent economists. And he went to work for the Federal Housing Administration as their chief researcher and um, economist. And he worked like hand in glove with um, Frederick Babcock, who is the chief of underwriting. So I've been through um, these, these files for the Homeowners Loan Corporation, where the kind of redlining maps are. There's, a, there's boxes and boxes and boxes in the National Archives, and every file and every city has been more or less checked out. And um, we see the handwriting from Frederick Babcock and Homer Hoyt, right? Like they supervised, you know, even though the kind of best known and most notorious redlining maps were produced by the Homeowners Loan Corporation um, for a couple of years. It was in the same building as the FHA and, you know, like Homer Hoyt and Frederick Babcock were looking at these all the time. So their, their ideas kind of went into, um, helped inform the development of this kind of like practice of um, redlining. Um, and, can, and can you add, I mean, it didn't, wasn't that group or Hoyt and those folks, they had a list, didn't they? I mean, can you make it Yeah, concrete? I was going to say that, that in, in Homer Hoyt's um, book, 100 Years of Land Values, um, quite, in, like I said, very empirically based, you know, he puts these kind of moral judgments on um, the kind of ethnicity and racial character of the people of Chicago. And so he has a list that, that um, basically says, in order, like these are the best to the worst for maintaining property and property values. And um, at the top are like kind of like Germans and um, the British. And at the bottom are um, African Americans and um, Mexicans. And, you know, kind of cycles through, I mean, it represents like quite well this kind of like continuum of discrimination um, and prejudice from the 1920s and 1930s. You'll remember that like this is, there's a wave of post-World War I migration. We're in the midst of the great migration of Southern African-Americans up to Northern cities like Chicago. And there'd been um, international immigration restricted to basically protect, you know, kind of like the Northern European races that had been in the U.S. for, um, most of the 19th century. And so, you know, he reflected that. He had the authority of a PhD of all this data of land values. And he basically said, these are the, like, this is how we value borrowers and investments. And then as the chief of research for the FHA, that informed the kind of decisions that FHA made about which communities to invest in, which loans to invest in, and like even what a good risk or a good community looked like. So, so that was the, the beginning of Homer Hoyt's career. You know, he goes on and, you know, like he, he's never, you know, as explicit or clearly like bigoted later in his career as he, as he is in, in like that list in 100 Years of Land Values, but it reflects this process. You know, as I said, the, the Hoyt and Ely in this era, 1920s and 1930s, they're um, they're kind of discriminatory. They have this idea of the kind of um, supremacy of like Nordic peoples. Um, but the kind of language of racial science changes and the work of economists and the, the kind of um, discipline of economics changes to kind of become much more race neutral. Where in the 1920s and 1930s, it was quite acceptable. Very overt. Yeah. Say that again. Yeah. Very overt. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Where, where, where um, the code of ethics of the National Association of Real Estate Board said, we shall not um, introduce any 
inharmonious races that will harm land values. Um, well, let's, let's, the, I, want, I want to go there next. So let me yeah. I'm, I'm gonna break in for a second and say, I think, I mean, what I think you're saying, Liddell, is that, um, you know, neither Ely nor uh, Hoyt were just sort of men of their time. They were actively involved in creating and promulgating discriminatory policies. I think, you know, if we have to, if we as LAI members, you know, how should we think about them? I think we have to accept that, correct? Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and that leads to, you know, you know, I were talking about this a few weeks back, and I think it's really interesting. We're a professional organization, Lambda Alpha International, we're a group of professionals, and you were talking about how, how professional organizations played an incredibly powerful role in promulgating and operationalizing these ideas. So can you spend it to a, a couple more minutes on that? Yeah, and, and so I'd say, you know, like what we see over the course of Homer Hoyt's career and his engagement with all of these organizations that, you know, like it be, the, the kind of discriminatory nature, you know, becomes less overt. But what happens is that those same kind of values of like what looks like a good neighborhood to investment invest in, um, what what's the value of right say like um, heterogeneous demographics, um, those are spoken of in like race neutral ways, but they um, still have this kind of fundamental feature, um, fundamental role in like best practices as they develop. And so like Homer Hoyt's career and um, the kind of work that he did later on reflected some of those same values, even though we cannot see the same kind of like um, discriminatory or bigoted language. And so when we think as um, like reflecting upon a wide array of professional organizations and some of the, the fundamental time-tested um, you know, aspects of urban planning and urban development, um, you know, we have to we have to say that some some of these best practices like still have these legacies and these roots um, in discriminating and keeping keeping people separate. Um, when we think about like land use zoning, right? Like racial zoning was um, struck down by the Supreme Court in 1917, but then land use zoning springs back up and is works, works hand in hand with um, restrictive covenants to basically put restrictive covenants as like private contracts and land use zoning as um, the public, the publicly executed, you know, means of uh, uh, managing city growth. And um, like we still, I think, have to think about what, what the implications of that are and how we might undo those. Um, you know, the, the, the you know, professional organizations, which were key, right? If, if the federal government establishes policy, um, really there has to be a partnership in some fashion with private enterprise, private practice to kind of fulfill it, to enact it, to spread those practices far and wide. That's, that's what FHA and Hulk did in the course of the 1930s and 1940s. Um, but also, um, you know, professional organizations that represent private sector initiatives, um, I think also can like organization by organization or um, profession by profession kind of offer some of this scrutiny um, of their own organizational histories, of their own kind of best practices and think and ask themselves like, what can we actively do to unwind this, right? It's not something that just yeah. happened in the 1930s and 1940s, um, you know, when people say like, this is, this is ancient history, like it's, you know, like the 1930s and 1940s, Never ancient, that there's still yeah. people who, who bought homes who are alive from the 1940s. And um, those community kind of impacts and choices and practices are reinforced every year and every day. And they must be actively kind of stripped back and um, reformed if we want to, you know, kind of undo the effects of racial segregation and discriminatory lending and discriminatory like um, city development. Perfect, I wanna, we got, I wanna, in one minute or so, I wanna look forward if we can and say, um, first of all, I wanna say, um, I don't know about anybody else, I, I think we can all agree it's been a memorable week in America. And I have to say that the thing that brought me the most joy this week, 
was watching this magnificent, our magnificent poet laureate, Amanda Gorman, read her poem about the hill we climb. And she said something in it. She said, somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished, which I thought was really generous and optimistic. And I think we, I appreciate that generosity. And I think we all need to be optimistic looking forward. Uh, I wanna suggest to everybody here that you know, we should consider her words um, as we think not just about the legacies of Ely and Hoyt, uh, but even more about our own roles in city building going forward as individuals and as members of Lambda Alpha and as other organizations and professions we're members of. So um, I, I, I'm glad we, I wanted to end, I wanted to get to that thing about, you know, the professional organizations, they played a huge role. We're members of an organization. Some of us are members of other organizations. We, we, ha we can't look back, we, did, we have to look forward. So my last question for you really quick is, even though you're a historian, and historians never want to look forward. If you had to say there's one thing you, you, you hope that your book will, uh, will inform for the future, what do you think it is? How do you see forward? Then we'll go to some quick Q and A. Well, I would say, you know, my work is just part, one, one example of a wide array of scholarship that is, I think, civically engaged and that works to be anti-racist and to both expose the really problematic um, origins of some of our contemporary practices, but I think also by forcing us and allowing us to kind of understand that that history and those practices that you know al allows us to kind of grapple with it and move forward. I mean, I wanna give um, uh, 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 credit to, for example, um, the mapping prejudice efforts at um, the University of Minnesota, yep. their work demonstrating, like studying and in in engaging people on the study of restrictive covenants um, has illustrated how widespread they are, um, how they were enacted continu continu continuing on a continuing basis, even after the Supreme Court decision in 1948. But it's illustrated that um, this is uh, um, a set of practices that has to actively be undone. And I think, you know, in part because of that, they helped shape the master plan for um, Minneapolis and Hennepin County. And mm -hmm. just as important, they've shaped um, the kind of civic conversations about segregation and racial inequality that I think were felt most poignantly in Minneapolis. You know, like your choice to um, read Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law is another um, kind of aspect of that, right? He's making the case for how this has been um, you know, established with and given uh, under the auspices and with the power of local, state, and federal government. Um, and while it's rear, rear uh, looking in the rear view mirror, right, like understanding how we got to where we are today is essential for unwinding and deciding in kind of a broad civic negotiation um, about like what kind of communities we want to live in and how we, um, we cannot like an understanding how long it took to build what we have, we can't simply throw up our hands. Like there has to be a concerted, coordinated and enduring effort to unwind these discriminatory practices in lending, in city building and um, um, in the way we can kind of conduct our lives in cities. That's great. Thank you, Liddell. Uh, Kathy, do we have any questions? Thanks, Peter. Yes, we do. Uh, we have uh, received uh, several questions. So I'd like to start with, and then kind of uh, stepping off of uh, our discussion about professional associations, um, one of our members in um, the UK <clears throat> has asked, was there no link with the RICS, which is the Royal um, Institution of Chartered Surveyors in the UK, which started in 1868? So was, why wasn't uh, there that, um, you know, more uh, circumspect view of, of codes of ethics or professional standards in, in other countries? Um, so I'll say um, Ely was like very internationally engaged um, 
I don't know of a specific kind of connection with um, UK organizations, but that, as I mentioned, not only did he do his um, PhD at the University of Heidelberg, but he studied um, kind of land development on a broad scale and um, kind of national national traditions and national land development policies in Europe um, as one of his lines of work at the beginning of his, his um, study of real estate development. So to Ely to um, UK organizations, I don't, uh, you know, I haven't found kind of close connections, but you know, like Ely is also working in a context in which there's like a good deal of the development, the birth of city planning in the US certainly draws heavily on um, European counterparts and especially on British counterparts. And so, you know, moving like beyond Ely, um, we can definitely see the influence of these types of um, European organizations in informing um, policymakers, urban planners, and architects in the beginning of the 20th century. Okay, we have um, another question which asks, um, why did redlining expand beyond the South <clears throat> to places that hadn't had experience with um, slavery the same way the South did? And I'll say um, <clears throat> I'm here in Los Angeles I have um, in, my, uh, in my work as a planner um, doing research and come across, um, you know, I guess indeed deeds, uh, come across these covenants myself, I've seen them, um, you know, from, you know, the mid uh, 20th century. And so, uh, you know, it is, it is really a great question. Um, so redlining, I think we should not think of as like only Southern in origin. I think we should actually think of it as Northern in origin. Well, clearly Jim Crow segregation, um, you know, like that is, you know, that's how we characterize this era at the turn of the century in the South. It was really the, um, the great migration um, to cities like Chicago, like Cleveland, like Indianapolis, like New York, like Philadelphia, that um, like basically exacerbated these racial tensions. While there were very small black populations in places like Chicago, um, there was not the same kind of um, tension or tradition of violence or violent practices. Um, you know, I think one of the key events that we should think about informing the development of redlining is the race riot of 1919 in Chicago. Not only there's a series, you know, like 1919 is known as the Red Summer. Um, Tulsa in 1921 is another um, example of this. But basically when um, African-Americans move into cities, um, this is where kind of traditions and like customs of segregation break down and then um, like civic leaders want to impose like rigorous policy procedures to kind of um, to to uh, to kind of affect racial segregation and I would say that in some cases like the idea is both of racial zoning and of land use zoning and of redlining is there's there's the hope or belief that separating the races will keep people uh, from like will, will, will stop or prevent racial violence it's seen as a progressive effort because they don't want race riots. They don't want um, house bombings. Jesse Binga was a um, banker who uh, was also a real estate developer in Chicago. In 1919, um, his house was bombed three times by people who didn't want him to um, build developments or buy houses for African-Americans. And you know, policymakers wanted to prevent that. They didn't want violence and they wanted a kind of bloodless and seemingly rigorous academic way uh, and policy procedures to kind of um, enforce segregation. And so that's why, it, you know, we kind of comes out of um, the North in cities like Chicago. We actually have um, an attendee who's raised his hand to ask a question, Sheila. Can we um, unmute William Higgins? <clears throat> 
is William still um, interested in asking a question? Oh, he just said, sorry, he accidentally hit the button. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, then. Um, we did receive a comment um, while uh, Liddell was speaking uh, from an attendee who said, to be clear, when we talk about the 15 year mortgage making financing available and accessible, don't we mean, quote, unless you were black, unquote. I don't know if you want to say anything, Liddell, about that. So I'll, I'll generally say, yes, that's the case. Um, there's a kind of small exception to this in, so the homeowners loan corporation for three years, they had $2 billion and they refinanced a million mortgages across the country and African-Americans were very small proportion. There was a small percentage of African-Americans in, in the early 1930s who were homeowners, um, they did get, African-American borrowers did get some of this rescue funding, this rescue refinancing. And this is before the kind of redlining mapping comes about. Um, and where they did get um, mortgages, it basically reinforced segregation in cities like Richmond, Philadelphia, Detroit, Chicago, et cetera. Um, and then it was later uh, when FHA ramped up and then the VA, especially after the, um, um, the GI Bill and the kind of um, home mortgage guarantee for returning veterans, that we really see the denial of um, mortgages and mortgage guarantees for African-Americans. So um, yeah, there was a brief moment when African-Americans kind of did get vaguely proportional um, lending but this process of creating a national apparatus and then the disseminating these practices, which took more than a decade across the country, um, then in the late 1940s and the 1950s and 1960s um, led to the kind of wholesale denial of federal subsidies that whites that were available to whites. Do we have time for one more? Let's do one more. Okay, great. Um, uh, this is good. I think maybe a uh, chance to clarify or comment. We heard from an attendee who says redlining is a simple statistical computation describing defaulting borrowers. Racial discrimination has nothing to do with determining redlining. Do you want to comment so, on that, Liddell? You know, my, my um, research indicates the very opposite. Um, Basically, the statistical, um, you know, calculations and the underwriting standards that um, that lead to either an acceptance or a denial of a loan mortgage or loan application at the at the end of the process um, has basically been developed. All those processes and the underwriting standards have been developed with um, discriminatory values. In, in, in creating those standards. So at the end, someone you know, like gets the underwriting score, or gets the underwriting standards, they're like, mm, I either got to accept or reject. Um, and it can seem like a kind of neutral or race, um, race blind um, set of decisions, but the whole process of creating under, underwriting standards or creating um, you know, all of these algorithms um, have uh, um, white supremacy and racial segregation kind of built into them. And subsequently they've, the, the, the text and the um, vocabulary has been made like kind of race neutral, race neutral um, even though the values are still there. And this is why, you know, like the Department of Justice still has been um, pursuing banks for redlining and why state um, attorneys general and departments of justice um, have been pursuing um, banks. Um, the Reveal organization reveals the um, Center for Investigative Journalism um, looked at what's called HMDA, HMDA, Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data, um, and published a report in 2018 that illustrated that redlining is still going on in 61 metropolitan areas uh, across the country, basically on a racially discriminatory basis by private, um, by private um, banks and mortgage companies. So it's, so it's ongoing, even though it seems like a, 
kind of um, rigorous or objective process. Uh, I feel like we're right in the middle of it, but we're at the end of our time. And, but the good news, I think, Kathy and Sheila and Christine, uh, is that there, this is the first of, I think, three uh, conversations we're going to have this year in celebration of the 90th anniversary of LAI. So uh, on behalf of LAI International, I want to thank you, Liddell, for taking the time to talk to us. It's been My really pleasure. enjoyable and uh, insightful and illuminating. So thank you. And thanks to all the rest of you folks for coming and listening to us talk today. Thank you. Let's mention that this uh, recording, this ah. webinar will be recorded and posted on YouTube, our Lambda Alpha International YouTube channel in the next 24 hours. Well done. <laughs> Thank Anything you. else, Kathy? No. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>